In a Simpsons episode from 1996, Bart went to Knoxville and knocked over the Sun Sphere, which broke and spilled wigs everywhere. Now, some of you may already know that, but do you know why the writers put that in the show? Don't you think that's oddly specific and almost random? Well, other than the Sun Sphere, they also showed this building in the episode, and that's a real place. And his name was Jay's Megamart. Jay's Megamart was located on Gay Street in the Crest Building. It had roller perfumes, pantyhoses, random hats, and of course, plenty of wigs. All these footage are from uh, a random YouTube channel I found, by the way. I'll link the original video in the description. Uh, so, if this is still not obvious, the store was essentially a remnant of the period of downtown Knoxville between the white flight in the 50s and 60s and urban redensification in the 2010s. Uh, and I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty here. There are plenty of resources out there if you want to look into the history of why black Americans tend to live near the urban core during this period and why black Americans like to wear rigs for that matter. Uh, they all have something to do with racism. I used to go to Chase Megamart to get a drink on my way to school sometimes uh, in the early 2010s. Uh, and I remember that uh, they only took cash, which was kind of annoying. But it was literally the only place you could go and buy like a bottle of uh, Coke between the old city and the UT campus at the time. Jace Megamart closed, I think, around 2014, and the space has since been completely renovated. The original sign is gone, and here's something that doesn't really sit well with me, is that they replaced the sign with the recreation of something from the 20s, back before the whole suburban sprawl and downtown being abandoned, etc. happened. Uh, I mean, that's fine, I get it, but also let's not whitewash the parts of history that weren't so great. And I'm not trying to talk about just the parts of history where things were terrible as well. Because those are pretty well documented also, because at least they're noteworthy. And I think the current generation is somewhat aware of them. What I'm talking about is the parts of history that aren't so noteworthy, that, but actually uh, make up the bulk of history and give context to the extreme highs and lows. I'm talking about the transitional, liminal periods where when, when nothing much happened. And Knoxville in the 2000s was, was that. Maybe that's because I was also personally going through a liminal period that was graduate school. By the way, the rest of this video is just going to be a rough oral history of downtown Knoxville during the time when I was there because I'm telling the story with my mouth. So that's oral history. I think it counts. Uh, Knoxville, during the 2000s, was going through what I call the beginning of urban redensification. I, I think I may have just made up that word. Uh, anyway, so as white millennials have decided that the suburbs kind of sucks and they want to leave their parents and move into the city. Uh, uh, and I reckon this is true for a lot of other American cities too. But I think what happened in Knoxville is slightly different from how gentrification played out in bigger American cities. Because there just weren't that many people living downtown in Knoxville when this was happening. Uh, I looked it up. Out of the 200,000 or so people who live in Knoxville, the city of Knoxville, there were only about 1,000 to 2,000 people who lived downtown. Uh, so it was just uh, mostly empty warehouses and parking lots and a few offices and restaurants. To me, it, it felt like a theme park for suburbanites to have a pseudo city experience. When in the evenings, people would drive and park downtown, go to the brewery or Tomato Head or Press Pub or maybe even the old city, and then drive back to their suburban bedroom community and rack it up multiple DUIs along the way. While the revitalization was already underway when I moved to Knoxville in 2008, the number of restaurants and bars downtown was probably a third of what it is now in 2022. Uh, downtown Brewery was already there. There was a weird bar next to it called uh, Sapphire, where you can order like a thousand dollar drink with an actual sapphire in the glass. 
it had a very 2000s tackiness kind of vibe to, to it. Uh, there was an Arby's on Gay Street, where Black Horse is today. And of course, there was Jay's Megamart, where Fat Tuesday is now. Uh, the French Market used to be where Starbucks is now uh, in this hotel. The hotel I don't think even existed uh, back then. Uh, there was also this hookah bar slash restaurant next to Datsos, and a Chick-fil-A in the weird mini mall in the first Tennessee building. There was a Lenny's too. I used to uh, get the sub there every time I go to this uh, recording studio that I have in this basement. And anyway, that's a story for a different time. By the way, for like four years, four or five years, they had this new urban living coming soon canvas covering up this, the side of this entire building but it didn't do anything the whole time until a storm uh, in I think like 2012 destroyed it. The whole scaffolding fell and it fucked up the road. It was a whole thing. Market Square was more hopping compared to Gay Street but still it had maybe half the businesses it has now back then. Uh, the only businesses that I think are still around from that time period are Press Pub and Tomato Head and the Subway, which is sadly, I think, is the only truly affordable food option downtown now. So the, the urban renewal did kick out the few cheap fast food places that were there. Uh, back then there were a couple pretty bad like ethnic fusion restaurants. Uh, Ruby Sunshine, which I've never been to, used to be a Blue Coast Burrito, which used to be Gus's restaurant which had a pool table. They're a pretty affordable deli, by the way. And they had a pool table in the back that had cigarette burns on the felt, I remember, because I think you can smoke in there. Uh, and there wasn't any uh, city commissioned graffiti in the alley, except for where Tommy Trent is now. I've never heard of this place. Uh, before, it is what it is now. Uh, it was a Froyo place, and before that, it was just a boarded-up building with a bunch of impromptu graffiti on the boards. 100 block of Gay Street was basically dead. It had been going through uh, multiple rounds of construction for years, and things only started to pick up around uh, 2010. Uh, I lived in the JFG building for six years, from 2009 to 2015. When I moved in, the building was, I think, only the second ever rental building, apartment building downtown. The other one was Sturchies. This is what JFG looked like in 2007. Still a warehouse. Here it is in 2011. You can actually see my window there. My rent was 700 bucks. It's probably close to double that now. Uh, anyway, on the weekends, you can park your car across from the street and pay an old scruffy uh, white guy to watch over your car. He used to watch porn on VHS tapes with a two-in-one VCR TV thing outside with the sound on. Hilarious guy. Java and Da Vinci's and Barley's and Pilot Light and Hannah's and Urban Bar were all already there in 2008. Check and Reels used to be called Manhattans. Uh, me and my buddy Chris would go there sometimes, and I remember one time there was this cover band playing whatever, I don't remember. But the whole room they were playing in was completely empty. It was a weird setup. None of the businesses next to it on Jackson existed back then. Uh, this all used to be a tailor shop with dirty windows somehow. I don't know why they're dirty, it's not like they're a restaurant. I don't, I don't even know how they stayed in business for as long as they did. Patrick Sullivan's was just called Patrick Sullivan's. Right next door was uh, Backroom Barbecue, which I missed the most out of all the places in Knoxville that closed, even more than Sassy Ann's. Speaking of Sassy Ann's, rip. Sassy Ann's was this place that me and my friend described as an upside down pirate ship. Uh, I think more than once someone fell from, from the catwalk on the third floor down onto the second floor. By the way, who the heck is this guy? I found this when I was searching for uh, photos of sassy ants online. You're telling me that this whole time there's another Asian guy who kind of looked like me and played in a band in Knoxville and somehow I've never heard of him? 
The music scene wasn't that big in Knoxville, and I rarely saw another Asian in Knoxville off campus. This is me from 2008 for comparison. Anyway, where was I? Backroom barbecue. Backroom barbecue is still, to this day, the only place where I could walk into, and the bartender, not knowing my name, would know what beer I wanted, and I would have a can of Boddington opened for me before I sat down at the bar. They also had the best nachos, according to me at the time in my early 20s. After a few Boddingtons, I remember my friend Jason was super impressed. This one time when I ate a whole plate of their nachos by myself, it was still probably the biggest meal I've ever eaten in a single sitting.、Uh, on the other side of Central was this place, like two doors down from Pilot Light, that only served cereal, but、uh, it's only open at night. It was very Portlandia. And then right across the street from Barley's was this nightclub called NV, like the letters NV.、Uh, there was a venue connected to it. I never figured out if that was also part of NV or if it if it was a separate venue. Anyway, I saw P. Lander Z there once, and several people that night thought I was part of the band because I'm Asian. You see,、uh, P. Lander Z is a Japanese band. I told you I stood out back then. So someone. Should have told me that there was someone else who looked like me who also played in a band.、Uh, Southbound.、Uh, I've been to Southbound maybe twice.、Uh, clubbing isn't wasn't really my thing.、Uh, anyway, back then in 2008, it was just called Club 106 because its address is 106 Central. Before that, I think it was called the、uh, Red Iguana. There was a shooting there in 2006. Uh, which probably caused it to change owners or at least its name.、Uh, and of course, who can forget Big Don the Costumeer? Lots of people probably.、Uh, so Big Don the Costumeer was this costume store or whatever you want to call it that was never open. You either have to call the owner or rattle the door chain to get the owner's attention. Who、uh, the owner, by the way,、uh, was a woman named、uh, Ramona. And Big Don was her dad.、Uh, Ramona passed away earlier this year in 2022. So going further south, this is going to be about the music scene I'm going to talk about now.、Uh, going further south on Central, back towards downtown,、uh, I used to have this practice space in the basement of this building.、Uh, we would sometimes find human poop in the parking lot, which we assume came from the homeless guy who lived across the street, who was found dead after a particularly cold night in. I like to say、uh, 2010. Anyway, uh, the building uh, or part of the building was owned by、uh, the dad of an ex-boyfriend of an acquaintance of ours.、Uh, the guy was a lawyer and sort of a hoarder. And I think the space used to be an elevator repair shop of some sort because there was a sign outside that says Otis Elevator Co. Anyway, the guy had bathtubs and alpine ski machines and treadmills and all kinds of stuff that we、uh, help rearrange as part of the deal to use the space. I recorded lots of songs there. I also recorded at this other place called Groundswell. People who knew about the Birdhouse would know about Groundswell. It was basically a co-op space that used to be a nail salon on Magnolia. I would play shows there too with the Fukokos. We also played at the Birdhouse a couple of times. Then there was this venue called Fireproof, where people would skate and smoke weed and get drunk at the shows.、Uh, it didn't have any ventilation, so it would get really hot in the summer. It was similar to Ironwood Studio, which I think is still around. By the way, Ironwood Studio was where my wife and I had our first sort of date.、Uh, there was also this place that sold meat. Uh, right on the other side of the underpass, overpass of of Jackson, I heard that they're building a baseball stadium there now. That's wild. What else? East Town Mall was still around. The drummer of our later lineup of、uh, Ulan Bastards, that's the band's name.、Uh, so the drummer used to run a vape shop there. If you can think of anything more twenty tens than that. There you go. That's what I call liminal Knoxville. Maybe it was just liminal、uh, from my perspective because I was just passing through. But almost everyone I knew who lived downtown at the time was kind of like me, except except for a few truly iconic locals, townies, who.
who are essentially NPCs for visitors like me. But I, I did feel at home for the seven years I lived there. The liminal Knoxville felt post-apocalyptic but also peaceful at the same time, if that makes sense. Uh, almost everyone was from out of town and we were just all passing by this place with more empty buildings than people. I could go out to any of the 10 restaurants or bars on most weekends and I would bump into someone I know. It was great. I don't get that from where I'm living now. My name is Yu Yun. Thanks for watching.